a little strange uh, lead-off speaker to have an economist, somebody who was with the Federal Reserve for 40 years. I started right after my bar mitzvah, by the way. Um, <laughs> How does somebody who worries about business cycles and inflation and whether we should raise interest rates or lower interest rates for 40 years, how does somebody like that get into uh, the economics of early childhood education? And as Pat mentioned, again, my expertise, and they've never asked me to speak on that, is pre-Civil War banking, but I'll happy to give that lecture someday. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you that backstory, how I got involved, and then I'm going to take you through the research that I looked at and why I came up with my co-author, Rob Grunewald, who was also at the Minneapolis Fed, came up with the conclusion, and this is the takeaway, that early childhood development is economic development, and it's economic development with a very high public, and I want to stress public return. So that's the takeaway, and I'm going to talk about the research, some longitudinal studies, one in particular, that we looked at to come to that conclusion. Um, in a way, that, that's, uh, that's the bottom line here. But I'm not going to leave you there, because there is this question. This is why I'm at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. How do you take that research to the real world? How do you actually make it happen? We know, we now know how to do this. Um, the question is, how do you do it in the real world? So the last part of my talk, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you how we're doing that here in Min uh, not here, how we're doing it in Minnesota, uh, one approach to it, and how successful it's been. So that's what, how I'll conclude. So how, does that, how do I get started? Well, for a number of years, we're going back 15 years now, uh, a group of us, um, there'd be some lawyers, some academics, some media people, we'd get together for lunch and we'd invite a CEO, uh, author, somebody with a passion for their, um, whatever they were doing, to talk about, pretty casually at lunch, uh, what, what, what they're up to. And about 15 years ago, a man by the name of Todd Otis, who was the executive director of an organization called Ready for K, Ready for Kindergarten, he had a report about this thick and basically making a, trying to make the case that in Minnesota, we should invest money in early childhood education. And I raised my hand at the end that I actually wasn't very happy with the talk. Because basically we're saying it's the right thing to do. He was making the moral argument. And I agree there can be a moral argument, but I said, look, Policymakers have limited dollars. They need to prioritize. They have to figure out, you know, where where that money is best spent. I mean, we know we can make a moral case for investing more in K through 12. We can make a moral case for investing more in health care for our children. We can make a moral case for scholarships to college for our most vulnerable kids. We can make a, a moral case for reducing pollution, et cetera, et cetera. So as I tell people, that was my mistake because uh, um, this organization, uh, the board, the director started calling me up, and the board of directors included a former governor of Minnesota, Al Quee, a former mayor of Minneapolis, Don Fraser, and they say, okay, Rolnick, we agree with you. We need an economic argument. How would you like to come on the board and do the work? I didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, but it was hard to say no to these guys, and uh, so I went back to the bank, and my young colleague who was doing my education outreach, economic education outreach, Rob Grunewald, I said, Rob, um, I've committed us to do this research, but don't worry. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some longitudinal research out there, and we'll write the back paper, do the, do the analysis, give it to Ready for K, and we'll be done. Take us a few months, that's all. And that's basically what we did. Uh, unbeknownst to us, Ready for K took that paper and pushed it out around the country, in fact, around the world. So this is 15 years later, and Rob and I have been virtually all over the world. We've been to every state on this issue. Um, I found myself about eight years ago, National Governors Conference, when uh, Jeb Bush was governor of, of Florida as a keynote speaker there on early ch childhood education. Six months later, I'm in Istanbul as the uh, guest of the president of that country, speaking to about four or 500 uh, delegates from all over the Middle East, including the Queen of Jordan on early childhood education. Again, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, okay, so that's the backstory. So what did we say in this essay that got all this attention? So I'm going to talk about one particular study, although there's uh, three of these longitudinal studies on high-quality early childhood education for our most vulnerable children. And this particular study is fairly well-known in the education circles. It's a Perry High Preschool study. And what they did, early 60s, Ypsilanti, Michigan, they take 123 at-risk families, 
randomly divided them up into two groups so the methodology doesn't get a whole lot better. I told my people doing, the, uh, doing my macroeconomic forecasting back at the bank, and I, I tell the public this all the time, the Federal Reserve is not allowed to experiment with the economy. But here, in this field, we actually had a real experiment. 123 at-risk families. There was a control group that did not get the program. And then there was the program group, which got high quality preschool program, which included two and a half hours a day, five days a week for nine months in a center-based program. But there was a, a, a significant amount of parent involvement, yeah, home visits. Here. I want to stress that. Really? These were three and four-year-olds. Like he's uh, so it was a two-year program, and, and then and they track school. these children. They track them for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, actually. We have data on 40 <laughs> years from period preschool. And then he makes the point. Now, it was interesting. Again, these are three- and four-year-olds that get this high-quality program compared to the control group. Ten-year study, it looked like it was a failure. The IQ goes up for the kids in the program, but by the third grade, they're about the same as the control group. So you'll often hear about fade out, one of the criticisms of early childhood education. Yeah, maybe you can do something for these kids early on, but it fades. That criticism pretty much came from Perry Preschool. But we had data on 30 and 40 years. We had 30 and 40 years data, so the children much later, and so we had a lot of outcome data. So here's what the outcomes were for these kids, again, compared to the control group. Children who were in the Perry Preschool were much less likely to need special ed were much less likely to be retained in the first grade, literate by the sixth grade, graduate high school, start a family, get a job, stay off welfare. Crime rate goes down 50% compared to the control group. So economists, business people would ask this obvious question. You invest early on in these children, and in today's dollars it was about $20, two year program, $20,000. What was the return on that investment? Pretty straightforward question that economists would ask. And it turns out we had, we knew the cost of the program, 20,000. We have these benefits, and economists can put dollar values on almost anything, and that's what we did. And then we have, when you have dollar values of benefits and dollar values of costs, there's a formula in which you can back out the implied annual rate of return on that investment. So we figured, if you look at the stock market post-World War II, the annual rate of return on that stock market is 5.8% inflation adjusted. So we're going to make the argument, if we can beat 5.8, you're going to take money out of the economy, out of the private sector, and put it into some public program, you should be able to beat 5.8. Then we can make an argument that indeed we're underinvesting. So we figured if we could get, the Perry results showed 6.5, 7, we got a good case that this country is underinvesting based on the Perry a pilot that we're under investing in early childhood education for our most vulnerable kids. We got an 18% inflation adjusted return. That number was so high, I sent Rob back and I said, Rob, I want you to go through it all over again because I don't believe that number, it's too high. Comes back a couple weeks later, 18%. I take all the data, I send it to the University of Chicago. James Heckman, Nobel laureate, who was also working in this area, I said, Jim, would you check these numbers for us? Uh, it just looks too high. He comes back about a month or two later, get an email, 18%. And the more we thought about it, the more we learned about Perry, we realized that's a lower bound. And why do I say that? And the Perry program, we did not have data on siblings in the family. Again, we're doing a lot of parenting here. Odds are the siblings are doing better. We didn't have data on any health metrics. We had no health metrics on the Perry kids. We're finding out now that children that are in high quality programs years later, significant benefits in terms of their health. Didn't have that data. We're starting to get data on children of the children. Didn't have that data. We didn't have data on the productivity of the teachers. If you've ever been a teacher, especially in the inner city where there's lots of kids that are way behind, uh, tough to teach in that environment. Now imagine you get classes in which most of the kids are engaged and you have engaged parents we're pretty sure productivity goes up for all kids. So 18% is in way a lower bound. Uh, critics said that's just one study, low sample size. Low sample size is true, but to get statistically significant results from small sample size is very difficult, and we've got very strong statistical results there. But there are two other longitudinal studies, one down in North Carolina, known as the Abbasidarian study. They started their kids at birth. They did get impacts on IQ. 
There's a, the uh, Child Parent Center studies in Chicago. They're age three to grade three. They're getting double digit returns as well. So we now have three studies that are showing very high returns to high quality early childhood ed education. That was the bottom line of that essay. Bottom line was um, we're way under investing in early childhood education. We know if you look post-World War II at the economic miracle countries in, in around the world, a key ingredient in every one of these economic miracle countries, including Japan, South Korea, um, uh, Poland, um, Ireland, and virtually everyone, a key ingredient is the quality of the workforce, is how well they educated their kids and their workers. So we know this is a good economic investment. So that was our bottom line, and I was speaking in Boston on this issue, and a man heard me speak, who I didn't know, pulled me aside and said, Art, I know you're thinking of writing the policy paper, that is, now how do you take the research into the real world? And uh, he said to me, uh, Perry Preschool is great, three and four year olds is great, but it's too late. I didn't know what he was talking about. You're gonna hear a lot more today about why starting at three and four is too late. But this was Jack Shunkoff, and he was author of the book, uh, Neurons to Neighborhoods, and he started to educate me on brain development and how critical brain development is in the first, what I call the foundation years, prenatal to three. And that something like 80% of the brain is already developed by age three, that if you don't get to the parents and the kids earlier, you're, whatever policy you propose, you're gonna miss a lot of these most vulnerable children. So Jack kind of raised a challenge. Rob and I were in the process of writing this second essay. So let me have my list here so I don't miss anything. So what's the challenge? Well, Jack clearly put out the first one, and that is you have to start early. Again, the foundation years, prenatal to three. You have to engage, and let me add, empower the parents. If you can engage and empower parents, uh, odds are you can sustain these results. You know, one of the best predictors of the success of a child is the mother's education. So we have to start early, we have to engage the parents. It's gotta be high quality. You're not gonna get the kind of results that the neuroscientists show are so important, that these longitudinal show are so important if you don't have high quality programs. You gotta focus, at least prioritize our most at risk kids. We call those our high return children. These studies mostly is, are about poverty children. Once you get to the mean family and get above middle class families, the returns drop off fast. So at least prioritize to make sure every one of our children born into poverty has access to these high quality early childhood programs. And finally, uh, the last challenge is whatever you propose, you better be able to bring it to scale. If you're just doing this for 20% of the children, this is Jeffrey Canada from the Harlem's Children Loan the lesson that he learned. You're failing. From an economist's point of view, if you had an 18% return, I can tell you in the private sector, it would not go unfunded. It would be fully funded overnight. We can talk some later maybe about the politics, why this isn't fully funded. So what sort of proposal do we make? Well, you've got a couple of economists who've been trained to think about the power of markets. So this is a market-based approach that tries to meet these challenges. Very simple, okay? Stole these ideas from higher education. Scholarships. Scholarships not to send children to UCLA or USC or the University of Minnesota, but scholarships so these parents can send their children to high quality early childhood programs. And then you're gonna say to me, well, wait a minute, Rolnick, what happened to the early start? Well, our scholarship includes funding for home visiting nurses and mentors starting prenatal. Very simple idea. So I was very fortunate, and now I'm gonna talk about how we're taking this research, if you will, to the real world. How we're actually implementing it. Because I'm gonna tell you, you can have great, great quality programs, but if you don't get the parents in the programs, you're failing. So it's one thing to say we need to have access, it's another thing to say to, that we actually have the parents and the children in the programs and are succeeding. So I was very fortunate when I was giving a talk like this to Twin Cities United Way, and the chair of the board was a man by the name of Warren Staley, who was CEO of a cargo company, one of the, the most successful private companies in the world. And he bought what I was saying, and he said, okay, well, I'm like, let's get you out of the ivory tower there at the Federal Reserve. Let's create an organization, raise money privately to see if indeed, if we created a pilot to show if that program would actually work, your proposal. So Warren Staley um, called up some of his friends, the CEO of General Mills, the CEO of Best Buy, the CEO of Target, uh, the CEO of Ecolab, president of the University of Minnesota, 
um, the head of the business partnership, which represents 100 of the top corporations in the state, created this nonprofit, raised $20 million to do two things. Part of the money was used to create a rating system, four-star rating system. So we rate, it's all voluntary, but we rate programs, early ed programs in you know, all over Minnesota now on a four-star. And then we picked a very low-income neighborhood known as Frogtown in St. Paul, and very user-friendly. We said, if you live in Frogtown, if your income is 185% the poverty level or below, congratulations, your child gets a scholarship. That's it. And uh, at first, we kind of had trouble giving these scholarships out. People didn't know who we were, but we worked with some community um, leaders. We, we, we were the mayor and, and some, some, some other uh, faith-based leaders. And eventually, the word got out that we were the good guys. And eventually, we ran out of money. We gave out 650 of these scholarships. My critics said, well, wait a second, Rolnick. You don't have three, four-star programs in this at-risk area. Well, as soon as the market found out we were offering scholarships, these parents had scholarships paying up to $10,000 a year. Uh, a brand new facility opened up in um, Frogtown. Montessori opened up uh, a new program. The public schools opened up, um, expanded their programs. And every one of our parents found a four-star rated program. We were so successful, and our, our results were so strong. In Minnesota, uh, half the kids don't assess ready for kindergarten, and the low-income kids are way behind. Only about 30% assess ready. In our program in St. Paul, we were up to 80, 90%. We then got some race to the top money and state money, and we now have what we call transformation zones, one in an Africa, low, very low-income African-American community on, on an Indian reservation, and in a rural, mostly white community, low-income white community. In every community now, with race to the top money and some initial state money, we're showing these incredible results that our kids are starting school healthy and ready to learn. And we're claiming, as the achievement gap in our state is very high, we're claiming that not only are we going to close the achievement gap, we're going to prevent it. So um, let me just brag about the state of Minnesota one more time because uh, with these results in this last session, uh, we were able to get a quarter of a billion dollars over the next four years we're working with about 10% of our kids. We're hoping to get it up to now about 30 or 40% of our kids. Ultimately, ultimately, we're pushing this so that every child, Minnesota will make the commitment that every child born into poverty will have access to high quality program starting prenatal through five, working with the parents. That's what this research is all about. This research is leading us to parent focus, start early, high quality, and uh, we can go a long way in creating, uh, Minnesota has one of the best workforces in the country, to continue that. And I'm arguing the way to sustain the economic success that the state of Minnesota has had is make sure that every one of our children have access to high quality early childhood education. Thank you very much. Thank you.